Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jesus Rodriguez. And today we have a great honor to interview Oliver. Oliver Gas is a Bolivian British journalist that is currently living in Bolivia and he works for a such uh, uh, and a great job covering whatever has been happening in Bolivia. Almost a few days after the coup d'etat against Evo Morales on November uh, uh, 2000. So basically what I'm gonna do is ask him uh, four questions and then he's gonna ask us one or two questions as well. And that's what I mean. Uh, we're gonna try this. Uh, um, as smooth as possible and uh, the first question is about uh, how are you dealing with this I'm, I'm, I'm asking you this because I am always concerned when reading your reports or listening to your podcast uh, about uh, how can be for you working in a dictatorship uh, covering news in Bolivia from a progressive perspective. So what can you tell us about that? It's an incredibly difficult situation. Uh, as you know, following the coup in November, uh, there's been a climate of political persecution, of authoritarianism. Just after the coup, there were two massacres and uh, the interior minister, Arturo Murillo, who is, is uh, coordinating the repression in Bolivia, said that uh, there will be a hunt for journalists, especially foreigners, who uh, criticize the new regime and who give a voice to uh, some of the social movements that were fighting back at the time. So uh, the radio state, I work at a radio station called uh, Radio Calcetra and Coca, and then we have an English language page called Calcetra News. And this uh, radio has been uh, pr probably the own, is definitely the largest media outlet that is covering uh, Bolivia from a progressive perspective. This radio station is actually uh, the official radio station of the six federations of the Tropico of Cochabamba, which is uh, the Campesino unions uh, in the Tropic, in the sort of in the center of Bolivia. And it was here where Evo Morales was once a union leader. So the radio is completely linked to the social movements that are fighting back against the coup. And for that reason, the government has persecuted us, has tried to shut the radio down. It has, uh, in a number of areas, has uh, stolen the frequency from which the radio transmits and communicates. So the frequency in the town called uh, Buena Vista in the department of Santa Cruz was taken, uh, frequency that belonged to the radio was taken, handed over to the local authorities. Uh, the frequency in the town called San Benito in the department of Cochabamba was also taken, uh, handed over to the state radio outlet. And there've been a number of threats made by senior government ministers particularly Arturo Murillo and the Minister yes. for the Presidency, Guillermo yes, Núñez, who, um, uh, who threatened to close the radio down. They say that our radio spreads uh, seditious messages that incites people to terrorism. And uh, they even tried to link the radio station to an attack that there was on a 5G, a supposed 5G antenna. And that's particularly absurd because for a long time, on the radio, we've been trying to spread real information about 5G, talking about how it's, it doesn't spread coronavirus, is not dangerous. In fact, it presents an opportunity for people around the world to connect and communicate in a much more important way. And it's a triumph of Chinese technological development, uh, which the US hasn't been able to reach. But they're trying everything they can to uh, throw everything against the radio, accuse us of inciting terrorism, of inciting violence. And a colleague of mine uh, a couple of months ago was in fact arrested on these sorts of uh, charges. He was arrested whilst uh, reporting on 
um, an event held by the union when they were traveling to the department of Chukisaka to hand uh, donate food that campesinos in this area had donated to help those who are struggling during quarantine. He was arrested um, supposedly for breaking quarantine. He still has criminal charges hanging over him. So that's the sort of environment in which we've had to operate. However, I think um, an advantage, something that is protecting us, is the fact that we are based where we're based, in the region of the tropical Cochabamba, because this is a very large region, uh, which is virtually 100. You got caught. Maybe it's the connection from your side. But anyway, I'm going to try, I'm going to keep work, walking. I mean, I'm the radio talking. and it's transmitters. Um, so it's, it you gives a certain level of confidence. You got caught for a second, but I, I have you back, so, so keep moving on. Okay. So within moments, uh, if the call is put out by union leaders, then they rally around and protect the radio station uh, through roadblocks, through physical mobilization. So right. it certainly gives us a space in which to operate, in which to, um, in which to work. So but, when, out, but, if but, we're but, out, but whenever you get out of there, you are in trouble, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, in the city of Cochabamba, which is the nearest city to where we are, uh, there's a sort of pro-regime paramilitary group called the uh, Resistencia Juvenil Cochala, who have said that you know anyone from this radio is uh, is seditious, is a terrorist, and you know should be should be targeted, should be expelled from the city. Uh, and I mean, we have a, an official car of the radio station to help us move about, and that's never taken outside of this region. That would be uh, targeted, to, targeted immediately by the authorities uh, and by not just the authorities, but also by right wing violent groups, the sorts of violent groups that were protesting against Evo Morales uh, before the coup. And during those mobilizations, uh, right wing protests, they actually targeted the officers that this radio has in the city of Chabamba, they burnt them down uh, two days before the coup. Uh, of course, there hasn't been any kind of investigation or arrest in relation to that. But uh, we're operating in an extremely difficult environment. Uh, luckily, you know, I mean, nothing's happened to me and, and I'm not expecting anything. But uh, right wing Bolivians are always trying to threaten us. Um, I mean, personally, I get messages every day saying that, oh, I've reported you to the authorities for sedition, this sort of thing. Uh, but I think for now, we're operating as, as we'd like, but maybe that will change as we come up to the elections, because as we come up to the elections, of course, the, the political situation will get much, much worse. Yes, that's true. That's true. I didn't know that 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 you were uh, based in uh, in Cochabamba, and it's nice to know that at least you are protected because of the place where you are working is like a, like a stronghold for mass. Uh, but uh, I I also wanted to mention that that I, I I don't know why I had the impression that you arrived to Bolivia after the coup. At least, uh, maybe it is because I start watching your coverage just yes, a few days after the coup, uh, especially on Twitter, on your Twitter account, and uh, and and I, I'm just telling you that because I, I I really believe that you came from Britain just to cover uh, what happened in after the coup against Evo Morales. So I'm now realizing that you have been there for a while. So you think no, you no, I did, I did, I did come after the coup. I was okay. actually working at at Telesur English um, before the coup uh, okay. in offices in Ecuador, and yeah, I, I decided that I wanted to be here on the ground. So I came to Bolivia in December, uh, beginning first few days of December. Okay. Okay, so I, so I a couple of weeks after the coup. 
Yeah. I was about to ask you about Sebastián Moro because that that's a terrible case of something bad that happened to a journalist thinking that maybe you were uh, in Bolivia before the coup. So, but uh, with what you say, I'm, I already know that you didn't know him, right? Sebastián Moro. No, I didn't know him. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't. I didn't know him. I wasn't in touch with him. But you know, we we're very aware about the case and what's happened. He yes. was killed um, just before the coup actually sort of took power during the sort of right wing protest. And it was at that time when uh, there was terror in the streets of Bolivia, especially well, only in the cities, in which right wing groups uh, were going around burning people's houses. They burnt down the houses of uh, prominent mass figures, uh, leaders, ministers, uh, and they also attacked a number of media outlets. They attacked the offices of Bolivia TV, which was the state TV. Uh, now, of course, it's state TV for the Anya's government, but before it was uh, state TV for Evo Morales' government. They attacked those offices. They forced all the workers out. They attacked the radio station of the Set, Set to Sebe, which is the Nas National Campesino Confederation of Bolivia. They have a radio station and their director was taken out of the offices and tied to a tree. And Sebastián Moro was uh, working with those people with the National Campesino Confederation uh, with the offices in La Paz. I understand he was working with uh, sort of media projects that they had the, that social movement, which is the most important social movement in the country. And he was talking about how a coup is taking place, you know, uh, look at what's happening. And he was attacked. Obviously, the, we don't know any, no one knows any of the details. The regime has refused to launch a proper investigation. Yes. Yeah, yeah, he was attacked, found beaten, and unfortunately he passed away. But of course, the regime hasn't carried out any kind of investigation. There aren't any suspects being held. So there's no, his family don't, don't know the, cir the exact circumstances in which he was killed. That's, um, a, case. That's a case that we try to follow because for us it was terrible to know about um, that kind of situation. And that's what scares us a lot about you working there and many others that should be working like you also. Uh, in the yeah, middle of that repressive uh, uh, goal, yeah, 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 yeah. so but let's move on to the second question. Uh, the second question that I have is about the elections. And how do you see? I mean, how do you see what? How do you see elections coming? I mean, uh, how is the popular support for the candidates? Who do you see is going to win? Do you uh, do you expect uh, alliances among uh, the right wingers? Because that's something that that particular last question is something that scares me. Because I see the the polls and everything looks nice, but adding uh, the second and the third place uh, make you believe that it might not be as easy for us uh, as the polls are showing at this moment. So I just wanted your thoughts about elections in Bolivia. Well, all the polls show that the mass will win the election. Uh, the most recent poll was released by uh, CELAG, which is a think tank. Uh, and they showed that uh, Luis Arce, the mass presidential candidate, is on around 41%. The second place candidate, Carlos Mesa, who is a kind of a centrist, neoliberal candidate, he's on about 26%. And... The, pre, uh, the current president, Hanina Añez, is on just 16%. So uh, this has been the case throughout for many months now that the, pre, the Añez is in third place. So, but as you said, the issue is whether they can unite. Well, at the moment, under if they if they don't unite, then the mass has already won by a comfortable margin because under Bolivia's election law. Uh, you only need 40% to win in the first round as long as you have more than 10% difference with second place. So at the moment, uh, Luis Arce is 15 points ahead of Carlos Mesa. Mm -hmm. 
However, as you said, if Carlos Mesa and Anya's unite, then they would, uh, there would no longer be the 10, the 15, that 15% difference. They still wouldn't be able to, to beat Arce, but it'd be enough to go into a second round, which, uh, I mean, it'd be anyone's guess how that could go. However, what I would say is that the polls, traditional polls, always underestimate the support of the mass because Bolivia uh, is an incredibly large country, but it's got quite a sort of sparse population. There are only 10 million people. The population is 10 million, or t between 10 and 11 million. Uh, whereas the country, the size of the country is enormous. It has Andean regions, it has tropical regions, it has sort of, uh, I don't know how you'd say it, in Venezuela you call it Llanos, you know, that sort of territory. It has Amazonian territory, it has desert in the south, which borders Argentina. It's an incredibly large country, so there's a huge number of rural communities. Oh, sorry, one second. Can Puedo usar el cable? Sorry, one moment. I'm just going to put it. Don't oh, worry, don't worry. Sorry. It's fine. Ay, ay, ay. I know, no, it's the cable. Sorry, one moment. I'm just... Don't worry, don't worry. Take your time. You can keep going. So there are a number of rural indigenous communities in Bolivia, uh, all of which will vote for the mass by about 80 to 90 percent. That's true in every single region of the country. So though, however, those communities are very hard to reach. Some, some of those communities uh, don't even have road access. So for a pollster to travel all that way to take small samples is not really worth it and can be very expensive. So the uh, polls are always carried out mostly in the cities. So in the cities is where there is largest support for the right. So there's always a gap between opinion polls and election day in that on election day, the vote for the mass is always much larger because of the rural vote. Um, so you can always add six to seven percent, sometimes more, onto the vote for the mass. So I think the challenge for the mass is to reach 50%. Uh, if they can reach 50% uh, in the first round, then they'll, they'll win, no matter what the opposition gets, even if the uh, even if the right wing all unite and achieve, say, 47, 49 percent, if the mass can get over 50, then they win. And I think that's definitely possible. We've seen a huge increase in support for the mass from the start of the pandemic till now, about a 10 percent increase in support for the mass, precisely because the government has handled everything so badly and uh, the economy has begun to fall apart and people are realizing that the, um, the economic situation in Bolivia before the coup was much better. And in the minister in charge of the economy under Evo Morales that built the economic model around the nationalization of natural resources and their redistribution. That person, uh, that minister for the economy was Luis Arce, who is now the presidential candidate. So I think that's going to be having that credibility, 14 years of economic growth, behind him, I think well, it's going to attract a lot, not just the traditional voters for the mass, but also some sections of the middle class who uh, are now suffering under this new regime. Listen, uh, one question that came to me while you were talking about the rural vote, I mean, uh, is the mass prepared to protect that vote? Have you heard of plans to, uh, because if I was Anya's government, I would be uh, planning on trying to get rid of that vote. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, obviously there's, there's the wider question uh, around the fact that this time there's probably going to be fraud for real this time. Uh, we know there wasn't fraud in October when Evan Morales won, 
But a lot of people are scared now that the government will rig the elections uh, because they don't want to lose, obviously. Um, on the issue of protecting the vote, there are a lot of efforts underway uh, to sort of um, to protect the to protect the vote. For example, the miners union, the FSTMB, has said that they're going to establish territorial union control in the mining regions of Bolivia. So what that means is that they're going to mobilise their members, uh, all the strategic points in their region, and establish effective control, basically. And uh, they're going to supervise the vote. And if there's fraud, evidence of fraud, then you know they'll they'll start roadblocks. They won't let people out. And that's how they plan to do things. I know in this region the unions are uh, already drawing up plans on how they can send their members to each voting station to sort of write down how each vote goes. Because in Bolivia, uh, during the vote counting, they show publicly each vote. So uh, what the mass is planning to do is to have observers in every single voting station to write down each vote, send it to a national uh, sort of database, and then the mass will know the real results. And if, uh, if the regime tries to delay uh, vote count, well, tries to delay the announcement of the official result or has begun to rig it, then the mass has the real figures and they can uh, declare victory. If, uh, if they have won. So it's, uh, uh, I think that there is plans. There's also plans to invite international observers. I know that for the elections that were canceled in May, I was personally coordinating with a group called Code Pink, who were planning to send a number of people to as election observers. There's also some talk of uh, a delegation from the Labour Party in uh, in the UK that they could send uh, a team of observers. So I think having observers that are uh, sympathetic to the mass is going to be incredibly important. Yes, yes, that's a good point. It's good to know that. And I was about to ask you about the international observers because a few days ago there were news about Agnes inviting, I don't remember, the, the Comunidad Andina, I believe, which is the Andean community, which is almost the Lima group with a different name. So I was like, wow, come on. The Indian community won't do anything against fraud in Bolivia's elections. Uh, to, I mean, they, they will do the opposite. They will protect or, or cover the yes, fraud. Yes, the fraud, yes. Exactly, same as the OAS. And in fact, just yesterday, the mass announced that they uh, reject the presence of the OAS in the upcoming elections. Oh, that's great. Of course, the OAS will, will, will come anyway, uh, but we think that their role this time will be in covering up the fraud. Yes, but the credibility is very eroded, and I hope that at least media won't give them uh, the, the relevance that they do not deserve. So let's see. It's just a hope anyway. <laughs> let's see what happens. Now moving to the third question. Uh, what about COVID-19? Uh, uh, we have seen in recent days, at least for the last 10 days, terrible images about coffins on the streets, uh, mass graves. Uh, a friend of mine uh, just sent me a message as, as, asking me to ask you about what is happening in Benin right now. He told me that there's a a big COVID-19 problem there. Can you tell me a little bit about what is happening? Yeah, the situation has degenerated extremely quickly. As you said, there's a number of cases of uh, dead bodies in the street, similar sort of thing to what you saw in Ecuador, uh, in the city of Guayaquil, but now it's, it's happening right across the country. Uh, there's now, in the, for the past few days, there's been over a thousand new cases announced per day. It's an incredibly worrying situation. And throughout this time, uh, Bolivia's had an incredibly high mortality rate because the hospitals have collapsed. There are no, there, the government hasn't purchased or sought out enough uh, respirators, ventilators for those who are in hospital. And in fact, the purchase of 500 ventilators 
uh, turned out to be a corrupt deal. In May, they purchased 500 of these sort of ventilators. However, it turned out that uh, they were faulty and they'd been they paid an inflated price for them. And uh, it was a huge, it was the biggest corruption scandal to hit this new government. So that's how they've confronted the, this crisis and the results are now what they are. Um, as I said, over a thousand new cases a day. We'll probably reach 2,000 new cases a day quite soon. And uh, in certain areas, especially the area you mentioned, the department of Beni is particularly uh, critical because the department of Beni is uh, in covers most of what is the Bolivian Amazon. It's, it's shares it's shares a very large border with Brazil, mm. and the cases for a long time has been the area with the second highest number of uh, COVID nineteen cases. Even though it has a relatively low population compared to the three biggest departments, which are La Paz, Cochabamba, and Santa Cruz. And the hospitals there collapsed uh, a very long time ago. The government hasn't sent uh, any aid to those hospitals. And also the, they expelled, just after the coup, they expelled the Cuban doctors that were working here, many of which were working in those Amazonian communities. So there's a large number of indigenous groups now indigenous Amazon groups who are now uh, facing a possible extinction even. They're facing a huge crisis because the, this is a disease obviously that's been imported from Europe uh, and then from Europe to the cities, to the cities, to the countryside. And uh, these communities for a long time haven't had access to proper healthcare and especially with this government that's paralyzed the construction of new hospitals. So it's a, it's a situation that's worsening and there's actually no incentive for the government at the moment to improve the situation because the government has been trying to cancel the elections, the upcoming elections, using the excuse of coronavirus to say that, you know, there, is, there are too many cases, we can't hold an election because it would risk spreading the virus even further. So if these numbers go up, that would actually um, have a political benefit for the regime in that they could then say that, uh, you know, the risk is too high, you can't deal with any more new cases, so we can't risk having an election in which people might, uh, might contract the virus. So it provides a perfect excuse for them to shut down democracy even further. So do you think that's going to happen? Absolutely. We know the senior ministers, Arturo Murillo, Anya's herself, has said that they don't agree with September the 6th as a date for elections, that they, uh, again, using this excuse of coronavirus. But we know the real reason is because they know they're going to lose. Um, so they're trying to just suspend elections, cancel elections altogether and rule indefinitely. Um, so cor coronavirus is uh, a weapon in our arsenal. And they know that by the time we reach September, the economic situation is going to be even worse because uh, the government strategy has been to impose a total lockdown, but not provide any support for people who have lost their incomes. So now uh, over no around 90% of Bolivians have lost either all or part of their income. 38% uh, of the country has lost the entirety of their income. Most people haven't received any support at all. So there's going to be a huge amount of anger at the government for the way in which they've abandoned the vast majority of the population, impoverished the vast majority of the population during this lockdown. And do you think that that, that will help uh, the, the guy, the, the eternal Bolivian candidate, I, I forgot his name, the one that is in second place, uh, the one that is, uh, was a journalist, what is his name, I forgot. Oh, Carlos Mesa? Mesa, exactly. Uh, uh, do you think that that hate on 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 Anes, the uh, handling of the COVID crisis, might help him and not mass? That's that's a very interesting question because it should help him. He should be able to sort of send a message to right wing voters who supported the coup but who are now suffering to say to them, look, if you're angry at the government 
but you don't want the mass to return vote for me. And that's certainly uh, a large section of the country, so he could benefit from that. However, his problem is that now there's a huge amount of pressure from the government against, on him to unite. There's a huge amount of pressure for him to unite with uh, Hernina Anyas, and it looks like that deal has already been made. They're, uh, they're currently in negotiations, but it looks like it's a done deal at the moment that they will go into the elections together. Uh, so that effectively destroys the argument he could have made, the powerful argument that he could have made of distancing himself from the government. He will now be the government's candidate. So he'll uh, have to carry with him all, everything that's gone wrong uh, during this time. Not just the economic question, the issue of education as well has become a huge conflict in Bolivia. There's a number of marches by teachers at the moment because uh, the regime has imposed what they call virtual education where people have to take classes uh, online so by live transmissions by the teacher. However, you know, not everyone has the luxury of having uh, high speed Wi-Fi in their homes. In fact, the majority of the country doesn't. And to pay through phone data to watch an entire class is incredibly expensive for people. So now the large majority of the country is going to have to pay for education where before it was free. So now there's uh, huge mobilizations and protests against the privatization of education. And this affects not just mass supporters, but the entire country. It's, the va it's over 90% of the country that is in state education. So... Um, that those people are going to be incredibly angry on election day. That's a good point. It's bad that that, that Anias and, and Mesa are planning to unite them, but, uh, but it's, I mean, but I believe that the move is stupid because if I was Mesa, I would suggest Anias to wait until the last minute to announce something like that on their currents, I mean, like, 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 like joining forces, I mean, uh, to capitalize a little bit the anger of the people against Anius. And then at the very last minutes, uh, announce a, 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 a joining forces uh, and that way trying to, to win the elections. That, that's what I would do if I was Mesa. But anyway, let's move to the-, to the That's to a good the, idea. <laughs> Yes, of course. I mean, but I don't know. Sometimes it depends on the on the rules, electoral rules, and that kind of stuff. But but that's Machiavelli, Machiavello uh, way of playing politics. But now yeah. let's, let's move to the, the 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 fourth question, which is something that maybe it's not nice to talk about those things. But I noticed, especially during the days when they were trying to choose the presidential candidate uh, in the mass within the mass, I mean, uh, I noticed uh, that there was big egos with, within, right now. within the, within the mass movement. Try again. So sorry about that. The mic is muted. Okay. Uh, so my question is, do you think that the egos within mass might affect the electoral outcome? I think it's an interesting what I think will it affect the election? I think no, but you're right that there was a lot of conflict around um, the choose of the selection of the candidates of the presidential and vice presidential candidates and is is, an, is a decision that wasn't taken completely organically. in fact, the majority of uh, the basis of the mass wanted to have uh, David Choquehuanca as presidential candidate and Andronico Rodriguez as a vice presidential candidate. Uh, however, I think Evo and sort of the group of senior, ex -senior ministers that uh, are in Buenos Aires now advised him that the, it would be wiser and more electorally popular to have Luis Arce because because of his track record in managing the economy so well and uh, his sort of his professional background, possibly giving him a base of support among the middle class. I think in the end, that's turned out to be quite a wise decision because um, we've seen 
Luis Arce rising in the polls quite rapidly and is gaining uh, quite a lot of personal support based around his economic expertise. However, it, that doesn't change the fact that uh, part of the decision of ordinary members was ignored. It wasn't ignored completely. The fact that David Chukwuenka is now the vice presidential candidate is because of the demands of the social movements. However, it, is, it wasn't, the demands weren't met completely, they were only met in part. So that initially caused a bit of tension. However, I think the, the mood among all the social movements now is that they're quite happy with how the campaign has gone. They're quite happy with Luis Arce as a candidate. He made a big effort to speak to all the social movements to get them back on board. And uh, there's certainly, I think, the way in which this, the, the situation in the country has become so bad and so dangerous, people have naturally come together uh, and united. However, of course, these tensions uh, are going to always exist precisely because the mass is a coalition of different groups. It's not a party based around one person. It's a coalition of huge number of uh, labor unions, social movements. So of course, there's always going to be a clash of interest and always uh, some groups come out on top and some groups will be left out. But I think um, people, people are happy about how things are going. Social movements are happy about how things are going. But of course, I think people do want, if the mass win again and are able to build a government again, I think people would want it to be a little bit different to last time. They want less um, sort of a middle class figures invited in to take senior roles. They want it to be a more organic government than uh, how it was for the past few years under Evan Morales. Uh, so I think there's certainly a lot of things that people would want to improve, want to make ensure that there's movement participation in government than there was before. So I think um, those are questions that are going to have to uh, be, uh, be faced when, if the mass uh, can take power again. I hope so. I hope that happens in September. And I will die if they postpone the elections again. But anyway, we reached, yes, we reached the, the first parts of the interview. So feel free to ask whatever you think is news about Venezuela or about us. Whatever you, you want to ask. Well, I think um, the only thing I've... Uh, would have to ask something that people here ask me all the time, which is, you know, how do people see Bolivia from the outside? And in Venezuela, um, is there a sense of solidarity with Bolivia, but also not just among the sort of Chavista bases, but also among the Venezuelan right? Do they feel a certain affinity to uh, to the coup government? How's a, how how do, how do Venezuelans see and understand what's going on in Bolivia. Just a good question. Uh, uh, I believe that, of course, the right-wing Venezuelans love uh, Agnes because he lo she loves to take photos and video chat with with uh, his counter her counterpart here, uh, Juan Guaido. So I believe that just because of political alignment. Our right-wing Venezuelans love Añez, um, but uh, if you ask me, the, the, the majority of the Venezuelan, the Chavista, the, the ordinary Venezuelans, I believe disregarding left or right, uh, I believe that uh, they know that what happened in Bolivia was a coup d'etat. You know what I mean? I mean, there's, there's and, and with, the, with the months that concept that realization has gaining weight because because of all the information that has been released especially the one in connection to 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 the elect fraud and all the uh, oas uh, reports about fraud and all the work that has been done to try to show that that work uh, from oas was a charade. So uh, I, at least that's my impression. Of course, from the left, from the Chavista points of view, I mean, we are with Evo. We miss Evo Morales for a, 
for us, not for only the Chavistas, but, but, but for Venezuela and for the political balance in the continent, losing Evo Morales as president of Bolivia was a big hit, and especially a big hit that was not foreseen. You know what I mean? I mean, we were expecting that there was going to be a, a, a hard battle for winning the presidential elections in, in October last year, but, but from there to having a coup d'etat a few days later, uh, it was like a big shock. Uh, and and and, and and we, uh, I'm still at some at, at, at some point. I was like uh, very mad at Evo for leaving the country, but then you realize that that that, that sometimes you have to take uh, that kind of decision to keep the movement alive. And 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 the circumstances has been showing us that Evo took the right decision because. Staying in Bolivia might uh, uh, translate the whole situation into a civil war or whatever. I don't know uh, what, what might have happened. Uh, so for us, Bolivia. I mean, I'd be, yeah. I'd, I'd, um, I wonder if anyone in Venezuela has been talking about how, I mean, Juan Guaido presents himself as the interim president. You know, I'm only going to be uh, interim for a so-called transition, and then I'll hand over power uh, with elections. But I think in Bolivia, we can see Agnes calls herself an interim president. However, we're eight months in, and there's, there's no elections. There's not going to be any elections for a long time, and they probably won't be even then. There's nothing interim or transitional about this government. They've changed everything. They've, they're trying to stay in power indefinitely. So I wonder if anyone's sort of saying that about Guaido, that he's... He's not an interim. He's going to be imposed as a dictator if he if he ever takes power. Yes, I didn't think it about that because I mean, in the case of Guaido, it's more complicated the analysis because he's a wannabe interim president. You know what I mean? Disregarding uh, uh, whatever he say in the media, I mean, the fact is that he do not control even the. Punta de Condominio in his building. I mean, the group of neighborhoods, the na of neighbors in his building. He is not able to to chair that that board in his own building. So I mean, he he doesn't control anything. So so and at least for Chavistas, uh, uh, thinking. I mean, we don't. I mean, we don't see Juan Guaido. I mean, what, when you talk about Guaido and Anes, whatever I see is just the failing of Guaido, you know what I mean? At least Anes was successful. But when you put yeah. Guaido and you put Anes uh, doing, a, whenever they do the video conference and, and, and that kind of stuff, I say, wow, this guy should be kind of ashamed of himself because he didn't even yeah. reach the goal of becoming in, interim president he he just announced it but he's not even there so disregarding all the money from the u.s all the interventionist approach from the white house to try to make that happen that haven't happened and that's at least from my perspective something that say uh, good things about the strength of the bolivarian revolution that many people consider death after chavez died so, so for me, that's and especially in the middle of the economic crisis that we has been facing since 2014, 2015. So, so it's incredible what we have achieved, if you ask me. And I believe that that resistance, that endurance, uh, might be the result of the direct involvement of the U.S. leading the coup in Venezuela, you know, uh, even even right wingers here know that the ones running the show are the gringos. So so that at some point touch your 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 patriotism, you know, your your national sentiment, and a lot of people, you know, reject whatever comes from that trend, and that's why I believe Maduro 
took advantage of that situation and, and, and move us, has been moving the country very fast in recent weeks towards par parliamentary elections. So, so he has been wise uh, moving politically at the beginning. If you ask me, I, I had a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, complaints about his handling of the economic situation, especially between 2014 and 2018. But in recent months, actually, even in the economic approach, he has been managed, ha, ha, has been able to manage the economic situation. And that doesn't mean that we are in a great position now, but I believe that we are way better than, 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 than one or two years ago. So that's the, the yeah. situation here. Okay, Same. thanks. Thanks for the, for the interview. And um, yeah, I hope we can speak again. Thank you for accepting our invitation. It is a pleasure and please be careful. Keep doing the great job that you are doing and protect Thank you. Yourself. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.